Wrestling Jacob, day for the day is a break in wrestling Jacob. I will not let thee go now, let me go, Jacob. Day for the day is a break in. Welcome to Clinton Church Restoration's online community read of the souls of black folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. The mission of Clinton Church Restoration is to create an African-American heritage site and cultural center at the historic Clinton AME Zion Church in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where W.E.B. Du Bois was born and raised. As a cultural hub inspired by Du Bois' work as a seminal writer, scholar, and activist, this new center will use interpretive exhibits and contemporary programming to explore his complex life and legacy, celebrate the work of this freedom church, and share hidden and untold stories of African-American life in rural New England. Our 14-week community read of The Souls of Black Folk will be moderated by Dr. Francis Jones Sneed, historian, board member, and chair of our Scholars Council. Each week, she will be joined by a guest scholar for a presentation of a single chapter of Du Bois's classic text, followed by a discussion with the audience. If you are joining us live, we invite and appreciate your participation. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box. For best results, we recommend you have the most recent version of the Zoom app downloaded on your device. Attendees watching via a browser may not have all the interactive features available. To see the full schedule for this community read or to learn more about the project, please visit our website at clintonchurchrestoration.org. Thanks for joining us. In wrestling, Jacob, I will not let thee go. Well, 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 till the breaking of the day. I will not let, not let thee go. Not until you bless my soul, I'm singing. Wrestling, Jacob. Day for the day is a break in wrestling, Jacob. I will not let thee go. Well, I went in the valley, but I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy, and I stayed all day. Stayed until you blessed my soul. I'm singing, wrestling, Jacob. Day for the day is a break in wrestling, Jacob. I will not let thee go, oh, let me go, Jacob. Day for the day is a break in wrestling, Jacob. I will not let thee go, now let me go, Jacob. Good evening, and welcome to our 14th week of reading of W.E.B. Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk as a community read in Berkshire County. We are very happy this evening to have Dr. Mary Nell Morgan Brown to be with us to discuss chapter 14. Dr. Uh, Mary Nell uh, Morgan Brown has been with us before. Before each session, Dr. Uh, Morgan Brown sings uh, the sorrow song that begins the chapter. So you've heard her before. And of course, she and Rashida Braggs opened this read with chapter one. So we're very happy to welcome her back again this evening. She is an emeritus professor of political science at SUNY Empire State College. Welcome, Dr. Morgan Brown. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Let me begin by saying thank you to Dr. Francis Jones Sneed, the board of directors for the Clinton Church Restoration, and all of the team that has worked behind the scenes to make this a successful project. Thank you also to everyone who registered for all or part of these webinars. I think of you collectively as gentle readers gentle listeners and active participants. I am honored and pleased to be included in this multidisciplinary group of artists, educators, and scholars who have led the discussions for this community reading. In 1999, I started to give away copies of the Dover Thrift Edition of The Souls of Black Folk to members of my family, my extended family, my friends, 
my classmates, colleagues, and anyone attending my programs on any topic having to do with Dr. Du Bois. Du Bois, I think, should, um, I think everyone should read this book, The Souls of Black Folk. That is why I started giving it away. And I think that the sorrow songs will help us to understand it better. Dr. Rashida Braggs, as Dr. Jones has noted, and I opened this uh, series of seminars. When we opened it, I noted that we should read Souls of Black Folk from the foreword or the forethought to the afterthought. The only chapter in this book it, that does not start with of is the sorrow songs. I have been dis just struggling to decide what to include in my opening comments. So great has been my struggle that Donna Gauger, trumpet player, my coworker on the sorrow songs and creator of the collage for this chapter suggested that the title for my remarks should be of the impossible task. That sounds like Dr. Du Bois, so I accepted that as my working title. I will try to weave together a summary of chapter 14, point out some threads of continuity that pull the chapters together, sing short phrases from a few of the songs, because for me, the entire book is a sorrow song. I will also try to share a few of my insights into Du Bois's character and highlight elements of the enduring relevance of the souls of Black folk. The operative word here is try. Think strive or struggle. Du Bois repeatedly uses strive and other forms of that word throughout the souls of Black folk. I quote Dr. Du Bois extensively in order to allow him to speak for himself and during the time for Q&A, maybe I can touch on some of the many details in this magnificent book that speak so deeply and profoundly to me and many others. Like David Levering Lewis, leader of the discussion for chapter 12, titled of Alexander Cromwell. And Pulitz, David Levering Lewis is Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Du Bois and he wrote about the songs and the poetry that serve as epigraphs for all 14 chapters in this book. David wrote, quote, until the souls of black folk, the souls of black folk had relied mostly on the sorrow songs, spirituals, to find expression. Each chapter in souls is headed by epigraphs that pair bars of music without the words, of a Negro spiritual and lines of European verse by Browning, Byron, Squinburne, Simmons, Tennyson, and others. Du Bois twinned them in this manner in order to advance the then unprecedented notion of the creative parity and complementarity of white folk and black folk alike. Du Bois meant the cultural symbolism of these double epigraphs to be profoundly subversive of the cultural hierarchy of his time. Until his readers appreciated the message in the songs, Song in Bondage, by Black people, Du Bois was saying the words written in freedom by white people would remain hollow and counterfeit." End of quote. In the forethought, Du Bois writes, before each chapter as now printed stands a bar of the sorrow song, some echo of haunting melody from the only American music which welled up from black souls in the dark past. Chapter 14 starts with a similar statement, quote, they that walked in darkness sang songs in the olden days, sorrow songs, for they were weary at heart. And so before each thought that I have written in this book, I have set a phrase, a haunting echo of these weird old songs in which the soul of black folk speak to men." 
unquote. The main difference between these two passages is that in the opening for chapter 14, a line is borrowed from the Bible, they that walked in darkness. And it leads me to notice that two sorrow songs serve as the epigraph for this final chapter. Lay this body down is the poem and the musical notation without the words for wrestling Jacob is the song, a song of praise and triumph. Among the several references to walking in darkness in the Bible, there is one that seems most likely to be what Du Bois would choose. And it is from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 16, and it reads, I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness into light before them and crooked things straight. These are the things I will do and I will not leave them undone." End of verse. This passage indicates a commitment to unwavering struggle, a commitment to triumph over adversity. As in the case of Jacob wrestling with the angel while crippled by an out of joint hip. In victory, Jacob is transformed and given a new name, Israel. This is one of many Bible verses, as well as one of many instances of comparing the experiences of black folk of, to those of Jewish people. To quote Du Bois, as in olden time, the words of these hymns were improvised by some leading, leading minstrel of the religious band. The circumstances of the gathering, however, the rhythm of the songs and the limitations of allowable thought confine the poetry for the most part to single or double lines, and they seldom were expanded to quatrains or longer tales, although there are some few examples of sustained efforts, chiefly paraphrases of the Bible. The music of Negro religion is that plaintive rhythmic melody with its touching minor cadences, which despite caricature and defilement, still remains the most original and beautiful expression of human life, human life and longing yet born on American soil. Sprung from the African forest, it became one true, the one true expression of a people's sorrow, despair, and hope. Ever since I was a child, Du Bois wrote, these songs have stirred me strangely. They came out of the South unknown to me one by one. And yet at once I knew them as of me and mine. Let me note that while Du Bois heard the African lull lullaby as a child, I heard authentic spirituals, probably while still in my mama's womb. What Du Bois heard goes like this. Do bana koba geni may geni may. Do bana koba geni may geni may. Bend a luli 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 bend a lay. That image of his him being hold, held by his mother and a photo of his father on the side just makes me imagine that she might have sung that song to him as a child. In after years, going back to what Du Bois is saying also in this final chapter, the Fisk, when Du Bois went to Nashville, he mentions that he saw the great temple builded of these songs towering over the pale city of Nashville. To me, Jubilee Hall seemed ever made of the songs themselves and its bricks were red with the blood and dust of toil. Out of them rose for me morning, noon and night bursts of wonderful melody, full of the voices of my brothers and sisters, full of the voices of the past. And I end that quote and go right to a Another one where he poses the question, what are these songs? 
and what do they mean? I know little of music and can say nothing in technical phrase. And let me add, neither can I. But I know something of men. And knowing them, I know that these songs are the articulate message of the slave to the world. They tell us in these eager days that life was joyous to the black slave, careless and help happy. I can easily believe this of some, of many, but not all. They are the music of an unhappy people, of the children of disappointment. They tell of death and suffering and unvoiced longing toward a truer world. The songs are indeed the siftings of centuries and perhaps explaining why he puts bars of music and not words, Du Bois says the music is far more ancient than the words. Through all of the sorrows of the sorrow songs, there breathes, breathes a hope, <clears throat> excuse me, a faith in the ultimate justice of things. The minor cadences of despair change often to triumph and calm confidence. Sometimes it is faith in life, sometimes a faith in death, sometimes assurance of boundless justice in some fair world beyond. But whichever it is, the meaning is always clear that sometime, somewhere, men will judge men by their souls and not by their skins. Is such a hope justified? Do the sorrow songs sing true? End of quote. Do you hear, as I do, in Dr. Du Bois's words, the words that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King spoke 60 years later in his I Have a Dream speech? His dream that someday we would be judged by the content of our character and not by the color of our skin. Dr. King's words were spoken on August 28, 1963, the day after Dr. Du Bois had passed away in Accra, Ghana. Du Bois finds that there were four stages of developments for these songs. Now, this is at the time, 1903. And given that he says that these songs are the only American music, I'm sure that by 2021, there would be several other stages added and we'd even be looking at rap as one of the items on this list. But for now, there's just four. First, African music for songs like You May Bury Me in the East. The second is Afro-American music, songs like March On and Steal Away. Then the third is a blending of Negro music with the music of the foster land. The result of the blending is still distinctively Negro and the method of blending is original, but the elements are both Negro and Caucasian. An example of this might be no more peck of corn for me, uh, which is one of those really mournful kind of uh, laments. The fourth uh, development stage here is where the music, uh, where the songs of white America have been distinctively influenced by the songs of the enslaved or have incorporated whole phrases of Negro melody in songs like Swanee River and Old Black Joe. In addition to pointing out four stages of development, Du Bois is, gives us his list of the 10 master songs. But he says, you know, this is not necessarily the definitive list. And he even when he finishes giving us the 10, suggests at least three others that have appeared in the Souls of Black Folk. And when I looked at the list, I thought of songs that I didn't see on it that I thought I would certainly add to it. Um, but the list kept getting longer and longer. So I won't even try to list all of those. I'll just list 
the 10 that Du Bois comes with for his master songs. The first is you may bury me in the East. The second, nobody knows the trouble I see. And that one, you see reference to it in the first chapter and also in chapter 14. There's a lot of going back and forth actually between chapters one and chapters 14. And um, when I sing these songs, um, I'm sure that I probably never do them exactly the same way twice. Um, nobody knows the trouble I see can also be saying as nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Um, and it goes somewhat like this. I'll just give a quick phrase. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. And nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Glory, hallelujah. Instead of reading the rest of the list, I'll just say that I was a bit struck by uh, the omission from this list of Go Down Moses, since historian Bernard Drew tells us that that's that was Du Bois' uh, favorite uh, of all the spirituals. Now I wanna turn just to some thoughts that I have about Du Bois and his character. Dr. Reginald Hildebrand, the discussion leader for chapter 10 of the Faith of the Fathers associates Dr. Du Bois with a trinity of beauty, truth, and love. I agree with this trinity and will add five additional concepts that I too I also associate with Du Bois. Art, freedom, hope, justice, and peace for a total of eight. I think of eight as the number for infinity. Du Bois often capitalized all of these concepts in his writings. In his 1926 speech at the annual meeting of the NAACP titled Criteria for Negro Art, Du Bois said that beauty sits above truth and right and they are unseparated and inseparable. Also, he says that all art is propaganda and ever must be, and that he does not care a damn for any art that is not used for propaganda. He emphatically stated in that speech that he stands in utter shamelessness and declares that whatever art he has for writing has been used always for propaganda, for gaining the rights of black folk. And you know that Du Bois that, uh, well, let me just go forward and finish this thought. One might say that Du Bois wielded a pen that he hoped would be mightier, mightier than the sword. Sometimes when he um, referred to hope, he rendered it in a puzzling way a hope that is not hopeless, but unhopeful. 
his ultimate hope. And I, this is something that is always, I think, necessary to remember about Du Bois and why he worked as diligently uh, all of his life. His ultimate hope was that the United States would live up to the principles in the nation's founding documents, the ideals of equality, freedom, justice, and democracy as self-evident truths. The hope of dismantling the false idea of white as superior haunted and inspired Du Bois's work, his work and his striving for all of the 95 and a half years of his life and still haunts us today in 2021. With regard to propaganda, Du Bois always pronounced it as just that, propaganda, and insisted that it should present the truth, not lies, and that the truth necessarily includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hence, in the sociological essays in the souls of black folk, I sometimes feel stung, even damaged by some of his language, terms like heathen, primitive, uncouth, and shiftless, for example. Du Bois's long life meant that he sometimes changed his mind. He believed that one should be committed to unvarnished truth. Truth is dynamic, not static. It is limited to our knowledge and understanding at any particular time. It was once true that earth was flat. It was once true that humans could not fly. It was true that humans could not travel to the moon. Knowing that truth can change should mean that one's mind can be changed without losing integrity and without being labeled a flip flopper. Ralph Waldo Emerson, transcendentalist and like Du Bois, a Harvard graduate, explained these ideas brilliantly and memorable in Self-Reliance in 1841. I won't read that. Uh, I think it should be showing as a PowerPoint slide. The silently growing assumption of this age, Du Bois wrote, is that the probation of races is past. Such an assumption is the arrogance of peoples irreverent toward time and ignorant of the deeds of men. So woefully unorganized is sociological knowledge that the meaning of progress, the meaning of swift and slow in human doing, and the limits of human perfectibility are veiled unanswered sphinxes on the shores of science. And here's my favorite passage in chapter 14 and maybe even the entire book. It is representing for me the passion with which Du Bois was, was giving us this, uh, this chapter and indeed all of the souls of black folk. And it could have been written certainly in 2016, he begins and ends with a question. And this is what he wrote, quote, your country, how came it yours? Before the pilgrims landed, we were here. Here we have brought our three gifts and mingled them with yours. A gift of story and song, soft stirring melody, in an ill-harmonized and unmelodious land, the gift of sweat and brawn to beat back the wilderness, conquer the soil, and lay the foundations of this vast economic empire. And the third, a gift of the spirit. Around us, the history of the land has centered for thrice a hundred years, and we have found peace only in the altars of the God of right. Actively, we have woven ourselves with the very warp and woof of this nation. And generation after generation have pleaded with a headstrong, careless people to despise not justice, mercy, and truth, lest the nation be smitten with a curse. Our song, our toil, 
our cheer and warning have been given to this nation in blood, brotherhood, and sisterhood. Are not these gifts worth the giving? Is not this work and striving? Would America have been America without her Negro people? End of quote. Du Bois was a multidisciplinary, <clears throat> excuse me, scholar and activist who embodied excellence in both liberal and applied learning. His work includes extensive research and writing, teaching, establishing and managing several magazines and journals like the Crisis Magazine, Phylon, and the Brownies Book, establishing and taking on leadership roles in national and international organizations like the Niagara Movement, the NAACP, the Pan-African Conferences, and the Peace Movement, co-founding Krigwa, or I'm sorry, the Krigwa Players uh, with Regina Anderson Andrews, he co-founded with her, which was a theater company, and so much more. Of all the many hats that Du Bois wore, he considered his role as an educator to be his most important work and acquire an indication, the most important human endeavor. It is no wonder uh, that The Souls of Black Folk is largely a book about education. The book is about uh, the particular experiences of Black folk, but it is really universal. I use this book as an essential reading with my students um, when I, before I retired from uh, State University of New York, Empire State College which is the non-traditional college um, for students or working adult students who always uh, develop their own program of study. And one of the things they are expected to do as they develop their programs is to look at what it means to be an educated person. So I required uh, Du Bois, the Souls of Black Folk for all of my students because that course is always taught, taught by the uh, faculty mentor or faculty advisor for the students. Sometimes I thought that my students uh, uh, actually uh, more than not only thought it, I got kind of that message from some of them that I was a tormentor because I had them read a book that they found to be difficult to understand in some cases. So to help them with that, um, I developed a strategy for reading Souls of Black Folk. Instead of reading it from beginning to end, do start with the forethought, but then read chapter 13 first, which is of the coming of John, the only fictional chapter in the book. Then go to of the passing of the firstborn, the shortest um, chapter in the book. Then the sorrow songs, the only one that doesn't start with awe and then Mr. Booker T. Washington. Usually they're all hooked by then. And many of them told me that they couldn't put down chapter 13 um, of the coming of John until they found out what happened to those two Johns, John Jones, the black John, and John Henderson, the white John. By reading Souls, students learn about African-American experiences and the recurring issues in African-American lives. The enduring relevance of Du Bois's classic little book. The issues of 1903 when the book was first published the same, are the same issues in 2021. The prevalence of these recurring issues often leave us exasperated and tired. And I would say weary, given a reference to the last song tired and weary as we struggle onward, never giving up, wrestling with hope. So Du Bois ends, let us cheer the weary traveler, cheer the weary traveler, let us cheer the weary traveler, along the heavenly way. 
in the afterthought, the gentle reader that we see in, for, in the forethought has become, O oh God, the reader. Hear my cry, O oh God, the reader, vouchsafe that this my book fall not stillborn into the world, into the world wilderness. Let there spring, gentle one, from out these its leaves, vigor of thought and thoughtful deed to reap the harvest wonderful. Let the ears of a guilty people tingle with truth and 70 million sigh for the righteousness which exalteth nations in this drear day when human brotherhood is mockery and a snare. Thus in thy time may infinite reason turn the tangle straight and these crooked marks on a fragile leaf be not indeed the end. And rather than end here, I will read briefly what Du Bois wrote in his 1953 or Jubilee edition of The Souls of Black Folk. First, he explains that he had considered revising the book, but he didn't, he concluded that he would not do that because he wanted uh, to leave it as what he thought and in 1903 and that he would write in other books if there were changes of facts and other things that he needed to make uh, it known that his mind had changed about. So he left the book as it was, except for a few minor phrase changes. And then at the end, he talks about the, at the end of this uh, updated, uh, forethought for the Souls of Black Folk, the 1953 edition. His very last phrase is the following. So perhaps I might end this retrospect simply by saying, I still think today as yesterday that the color line is a great problem of this century. But today I see more clearly than yesterday that back of, this, back of the problem of race and color lies a greater problem which both obscures and implements it. And that is the fact that so many civilized persons are willing to live in comfort, even if the price of this is poverty, ignorance and disease of the majority of their fellow men. That to maintain this privilege, men have waged war until today war tends to become universal and continuous. And the excuse for this war continues largely to be color and race, end of quote. And I will end here and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morgan Brown. That was beautiful. Um, uh, uh, not only um, giving us a, um, a, a summary, though brief in your thoughts, I know, but uh, also wrapping it up so beautifully of how the book kind of holds together from chapter one through chapter 14. Um, uh, and just thank you for your contribution to this series of your wonderful voice. And, and the way that you do all of these things. We are so grateful uh, to have you on this project. And I was thinking that why didn't you sing just a fraction of Go Down Moses? Since oh. that is Du Bois's favorite song and um, you didn't even give voice to that. So um, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but that's what friends do sometimes. Uh, do you think you could just give us a, a little flavor of Go Down Moses? I will be happy to do that. Um, I, I, I Let me first just say, you know, there's limited time and there's so much that I would love to say and sing that there just isn't time to do it in this um, kind of setting. But Go, go Down Moses, is um, I will I will try. <clears throat> when Israel was in Egypt land, 
let my people go oppressed so hard they could not stand let my people go go down moses way down in egypt land tell pharaoh to let my people go i'll stop there beautiful Mary. Is that enough? <laughs> yeah, it's, of course it's never enough for me i i love your voice and i love your singing so i could just sit here and listen to it for the rest of the evening but thank you so much for being willing to to do that uh, little portion for us and and we must uh uh, hear more of you so, uh, sometimes uh, later, I hope, uh, when we extend the project uh, a little longer in which we are talking a little bit about earlier before uh, we actually came on board. But thank you so much. Um, thank this, you for asking. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> we have uh, three questions, um, um, or maybe even more than three questions. Um, uh, Mr. Everett Brinson, our friend from Colorado and, and fellow, fellow uh, uh, Berkshireite growing up in Great Barrington ask, I have heard that the melody of Amazing Grace came from the bowels of the slave ship. Have you heard that? Yes, I have heard that. And Amazing Grace doesn't qualify as a spiritual, by the way. It is a hymn. Uh, and it, um, I'm not going to be able to uh, recall the, the name of the captain of the ship who wrote this, uh, that hymn. Um, but just think about the words, uh, saved a wretch like me. <laughs> uh, sometimes I do sing Amazing Grace because people really love that hymn. Uh, and often when I sing it, instead of calling, instead of using the word wretch, I use the word soul. Um, and uh, yeah, but to, I, I guess to make the, the answer to the question shorter or as short as possible is, yes, I have heard that. And it is, to my understanding, a true story, a true account of how the, the hymn was, uh, how it came about. Yes, um, and the captain of the ship was called uh, was named John Newton, and uh, <laughs> and there um, also there, the song. Yeah, and then <laughs> there is a um, um, there's a number of um, uh, films uh, that that have mm -hmm. been made about Newton and and I guess his um, conversion to Christianity actually is is what it was. Um, we know that the sorrow songs, as uh, Du Bois has uh, put it, is, is what we call in modern day the spiritual. And mm -hmm. um, you said that Amazing Grace is a hymn. What is the difference between a hymn and the spiritual? Well, first, I guess the obvious thing you can note about the, the hymn that Newton wrote is that it is not a song that is created by enslaved people. Okay. Um, and so, um, and the hymns are part of church celebration and so are, are spirituals. And they were even being called spirituals during Du Bois's time. Um, he, you know, I think I might've intended to say if I didn't say that if you notice for the souls of black folk, the title of the first chapter is of our spiritual strivings. Mm -hmm. Then in the end, he calls, he uses simply the sorrow songs. Mm -hmm. And I should say that, and, and this is probably something I should have uh, paid more attention to when I was preparing what I would comment about, that if you notice, even though largely the sorrow songs is about the spirituals, they are also about, um, uh, the chapter, I'm sorry, is also about, um, a song like the um, um, 
the 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 use of um, the the sorrow involved in uh, loss of love or you losing a lover. Uh, I'm thinking of the song um, that he compares to the German folk song about the sadness over losing one's love. Mm -hmm. So Du Bois is recognizing that it's not just the spirituals that are sorrow songs. There are other folk songs that are sorrow songs. Yeah. And, and I think that um, very interestingly, um, we're talking about the peasants, uh, uh, you know, the working folks, you know, from, uh, he was talking about those people from each culture and just not uh, black folk, but he's comparing uh, black folks' lives with those and saying it, they, they are indeed similar. But uh, another difference, and I think is a big difference um, between the spiritual and hymns, hymns always come with uh, accompanied by musical instruments of some kind, right? Uh, the spirituals uh, were created just with the human voice, uh, a cappella, as it were. And it's, it, it's a chilling kind of way to hear that music. You know, it, it's a difference when you add instruments to the spiritual, uh, uh, to the spiritual and when you actually hear it a cappella, And that's the reason I think, you know, your voice, when you, you sing those songs, I'm, I'm, I'm like the boys, it reaches uh, some part of me uh, that I had in my mother's womb, you know, one way or the other. So, you know, I can just tell it's, it's of and about us, you know, it's, it's such a wholeness and we don't need any accompaniment, you know, for that whole kind of thing, so. At most, you might get a clapping of hands, yes. a stamping of feet. Yes. Uh, and and I grew up in rural Georgia, where that is how I experienced the songs. Um, in our church, we didn't have a, a piano in my youth, uh, and the most joyful sound you could ever imagine was created by the people in our congregation. Mm -hmm. And we sang, and we sang together. That's another thing about the spirituals. They, uh, Du Bois talks about, they are often led by some lead, leading minstrel or, you know, someone who takes the lead mm -hmm. and, and others join in and others join in in harmony, just instinctively. And the songs, once they are created, can't really be truly captured in that same way again, because that's not the nature of the spirituals. They come out of the spirit, out of the soul. Yeah, in fact, um, Nadine Wedderburn has said, spiritual are the issuance of the soul. You know, mm. it, it comes from the soul. So uh, that's beautiful, Nadine, thank you. Um, uh, someone asked, can we understand how uh, Du Bois reconciled his early Christian upbringing with the atheism of the communism at the end of his life. Are there any writings on this? Um, you wanna to speak to that or? Um, I, I will just say that while, even while Du Bois was uh, becoming, um, uh, embracing socialism and uh, choosing to become a, a member of the communist party, he never forsake, forsook uh, the value of church and the spirituals that were performed in them, uh, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, you might, uh, off the top of my head at the moment, I cannot refer to a particular source uh, where this has been written about, but I know that there are uh, resources on that, on that topic. And by the way, um, Du Bois, uh, from 19, uh, roughly 19, uh, when he was in Atlanta, uh, in the early 1900s, I won't say the years because I'm afraid I might um, misspeak them, but early in the, in the 1900s, he compiled a list of prayers for dark people. Uh, in fact, I think that might be the title of the book. And they were edited by Herbert Apthecker, 
uh, who many people would say is uh, was a communist gentleman, but he also uh, was the um, he had in in Du Bois in his possession Du Bois's library when Du Bois was leaving the U.S. going to Ghana uh, where he died, yeah. and so he he found this envelope this Manila envelope with this collection of of prayers, and he published them in a book that he edited. Yeah. I, I think a, a good source would be volume two of David Levin Lewis's biography of Du Bois, because I think that um, Levering Lewis um, discusses, um, uh, you know, communism and, and Du Bois' decision to join uh, the American Communist Party. Um, when he was here talking about Alexander Will Cromwell, um, I think a similar question was asked and he denies that, that Du Bois was an atheist. Um, um, I think we're addressing that. Yes, um, uh, we addressed that before. And so to get his take on that, I would go and look at that second chapter uh, that he wrote uh, on Du Bois' biography. Um, William Loeb, uh, Bill Loeb says, I note that the first singers to quote unquote go north were said by Du Bois to go to Cincinnati, in which case they would undoubtedly have been welcomed by West Stockbridge's Charles Borton, longtime minister and underground railroad operator. Another Berkshire connection there. Thank you, Bill. That sounds great. You have any uh, response for Bill, Mayor Neil? No, except to say that that is probably exactly what happened. Uh, it's not something that I found in my uh, research. And, and I might also say that I have not done what I would love to do, um, a delving into the travels of the Jubilee singers, because not only did they travel within the US, they traveled abroad as well. And Du Bois, of course, credits them with making it making these songs known to the world. Yeah, very great. Larry Wallach says, hello, Mary Nell. Uh, it was Hi, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> it was great to hear your thoughts and your voice. In terms of the choice of chapters, I have found that chapter two is one of the most essential since it highlights the need for greater understanding of American history of which black history is an inseparable essential part. How do you introduce your students to the historical component, especially the role that race relation has played throughout American history? Wow. Um, I, I do exactly in part what Lara has suggested there. Um, there is no way you can tell the American story without telling uh, the story of black folks in America. And even when there is an effort to uh, not focus on Black folk. Their presence is so obvious in whatever story you have to tell. Um, uh, Toni Morrison deals with that in the speech where she uh, accepted her Pulitzer Prize and, and she titled it Playing in the Dark and, and made the same observation that I'm just making that even when there's no black character in the story. You know that behind the scenes, there's influence from the presence of black folk. And of course, Du Bois addressed it uh, in that quote that I read from chapter 14, uh, that you cannot uh, talk about our, this, the history of this country and not include the history of black folk. And if you're going to do it the way Du Bois would have done it, you have to tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's just how you, the story will have to go. Um, I agree with, uh, you know, chapter two, um, it's real hard to choose a chapter in the Souls of Black Book, which is, is the, you know, um, my favorite, but I always uh, fall back to chapter two because it talks about reconstruction. And that happens to be my field of study. And so when I teach US one, when we talk about the civil war and reconstruction, I have my students read that chapter for an explanation of um, the reconstruction 
that is not often included in the US history textbook. Um, and although we've had a, a, re, uh, a, a revision of that reconstruction uh, narrative, especially by Eric Foner, uh, Foner owes a great debt to uh, Black Reconstruction uh, of Du Bois's book. And um, that, that Black Reconstruction started with that chapter two, when he was talking about the Freedmen's Bureau and how uh, the reconstruction could have gone differently one way or the other. So it's a beautiful chapter and I love that chapter, uh, you know, uh, a lot. Yeah, so do I. I. You know, I love all this book. <laughs> uh, and it's really difficult to uh, choose a chapter uh, that is more uh, significant in what it teaches us. And the book, for me, teaches me something new every time I re read it. Um, du Bois uh, was uh, drawing upon. Um, some of the studies that he had already completed as a part of his Atlanta uh, University studies, uh, where he had laid out a program for himself that for every decade or in periods of 10 years, he would deal with topics on focusing on the uh, status of Black folk in the US, looking at their levels of education, looking at their um, health uh, status, looking at uh, work and income. Uh, each year he had an Atlanta conference study for 13 years. And he, so he got through the first 10 and had started again to uh, repeat collecting information. And that, um, that collection um, served in part for his uh, reconstruction, mm -hmm. you know, black reconstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was uh, trying to, um, I think, correct the his histories that were being written about what black reconstruction was mm -hmm. uh, and tell an authentic story about reconstruction. Uh, and prior to Fauna's uh, more recent book, I don't think there was a, a study of reconstruction that could even begin to uh, measure up to what Du Bois did in Black Reconstruction. I agree. And David Levin Lewis uh, uh, says that Black Reconstruction is um, Du Bois's opus. It yes, he does. His Magnus opus. So um, uh, the book uh, about Du Bois uh, and the importance of his spirituality. Uh, John Horan, who is uh, one of our um, backstage crew, <laughs> uh, says uh, uh, is American Prophet by Edward J. Bloom. If anybody's uh, uh, wanted to, uh, you know, look at that. I hope that what we will do is that we'll have on our website is the, a development of a, a resource guide. Of, uh, of, of books and articles, if people are, you know, defined by a topic, if people are actually interested in uh, further looking at that. So thank you, John, for that. Uh, Lena yeah. Ap Apadu is in, um, in the audience. Hello, Lena. Uh, she says, hello, Mary Nell. I enjoyed your wonderful singing and discussion. Are you familiar with Zora Neale Hurston's term for the spirituals as quote unquote, neo-spirituals? She argues that these songs in their original form were rendered a cappella and without harmony. As you mentioned, they were sung in your home church. Um, Zora Neale Hurst, uh, Hurston is one of my sheroes, I guess. Um, and, and, you know, she and Du Bois corresponded. They uh, had come up with, or, or Zora Neale was suggesting to Du Bois that there should be a way to honor black folks uh, by having a cemetery in Florida where all people of all black people of note should be buried. <laughs> and she wanted it to be in Florida because the weather was always good. The funeral, um, the, um, the cemetery could be beautiful because of the thriving of beautiful 
uh, plant life and all that kind of thing. Um, and her, um, her folklore, if you will, um, is very telling about black life uh, and her, um, her description of spirituals, uh, I think is um, right on except for the part about the harmony because I do think that the harmony happened spontaneously when people sang the songs together. And that's one of the things I like to have the opportunity to do, to do when I sing the spirituals to have it be participatory that I'm not just singing to people, that people are singing with me. Uh, I think you like uh, uh, the call and response uh, impulse that goes along with uh, the spirituals and um, you know, black uh, religion uh, more than anything else, uh, right? Uh, hi, Marissa Massery says, beautiful, thank you for this. Du Bois alludes to the cultural appropriation throughout the book. This is a kind of a big question, but how do you think Du Bois would respond to the evolution of black cultural appropriation in American music from when he was alive until now? Whoa, that is a big question. Well, I think he answered that in, in when he did that uh, four stages of development. Mm -hmm. where he says um, whole phrases are incorporated into the Caucasian music and often he, uh, mentioned uh, in chapter 14 that sometimes the source is uh, forgotten or not credited. <laughs> um, and I think he would be saying those same things now, but uh, he would be um, looking at a, a much uh, more expansive list of, of stages of development. Yeah, and, 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 and still pointing out you know, how could America be America without uh, her Negro people? Her Negro people. And uh, it, it, the interesting thing, uh, Marissa, about the continuing evolution of, um, of, of music, Black music, is that uh, it keeps changing, right? Uh, from uh, rock and roll to doo wop to uh, now rap and, you know, so, you know, in, in 10 years, there'll be something else because uh, it seems like Black people are always creating something that others would want to imitate. So, because um, I, I have to say like Du Bois, uh, we are the originals. So, uh, <laughs> well, I think that's still going to be true. Dolan Hubbard is in the audience. Hello, Professor Hello. Hubbard. Hello, and Professor. Cheers for a stunning meditation on Du Bois, he says. To what extent do the sorrow song spirituals play a central role in the cultural imagination of Black Americans? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to what extent? Yes. Um, I, I think you, you don't have to look far to, to see how we are influenced by our music. Um, our poetry is music. Um, our, uh, our sermons are music. Um, the movements that we create in dance are inspired by our music. I, I don't think that you can uh, address our cultural expressions without dealing with our creation of songs. Yes. Large extent, sir. Large. Large extent. <laughs> <laughs> All encompassing. Yes, extent, yes. I think. Yeah. Um, someone asked the last quote from Du Bois could be a recent criticism, especially with the recent freezing weather and the way our country relies on the poor and at the time loves to punish people for being poor. Um, yes, I, I think that um, uh, Mary Nell spoke to this that indeed, um, although it was written in 1903, uh, a lot of passages in, in the Souls of Black Folks seems that you know, we could have, could have been written in 2021 and certainly impact 2021. And that is why we believe that Du Bois and the Souls of, reading of the Souls of Black Folk is so important. You know, the, um... I don't remember precisely the, the chapter that it's in, but it's very, 
early in the book, I believe, where he talks about to be a poor people, how uh, degrading or whatever that is, how, how that can be uh, devastating, but to be a poor race in a land of dollars and cents, how devastating that is for black people. But you know, the one thing we, we I think absolutely have to um, remember is that black people in the United States are disproportionately poor because for centuries, we were forced to work ourselves to death with no pay. Any group of people who do not reap the, reap the benefits of their labor would be poor. Yes. And when nothing is ever done to address that, then you just perpetuate that standing. Yes, yes, I agree. Linda, um, I think that uh, your question, can you discuss a bit more the appropriation of Negro spirituals by the white community is a larger conversation that um, uh, hopefully we can come back to at a later time. Um, but uh, Emily Owls asked, why does um, Du Bois put the sorrow song, the chapter on the sorrow song as the last chapter? Wouldn't it have been better as the first chapter as an introduction for us? Maybe was, so, what, Emily. What, what was his intention? Any sense of what Du Bois' intention was placing it um, at the end? Well, of course it would be speculation since I don't know if Du Bois has ever ventured to try to explain the ordering of the chapters, but knowing how he thinks, I'm sure he had some reasoning behind it. Um, and um, if you notice this chapter pulls, it, it harkens back to the very first chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he leads us through all kinds of uh, experiences, primarily in the South. Um, I sometimes, since I'm from Georgia and I feel very proud to be from Georgia uh, right at this moment, um, this is a Georgia book of the Black Belt, of the quest of the Golden Fleece. There's so many chapters where he is in the deep um, Black Belt of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's Tennessee, uh, even though there are so many places that can claim Du Bois, right? Massachusetts as his state of birth, New York as this, where I now live, as a state where he spent many of his productive years uh, as um, one of the leaders in the uh, NAACP. Um, but uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm wandering away, I think, from the, the question that Emily is asking me to address, uh, you know, why did he put the sorrow songs last? Um, I think it, it is like the punctuation of, you know, the book is a sorrow song. Um, that struggle that he, uh, that the Bible tells us about uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel and, and the outcome as triumph and transformation, uh, that's what he's hoping this book is going to contribute to, which is why he says he hopes that these crooked lines on uh, a, page, a fragile page will not indeed be the end and he doesn't put a period there. In fact, so uh, uh, our, our staff says it feels like a benediction. Uh, mm. Yeah, I, I like that. Uh, I like that too. Uh, Professor Hubbard recommends a book that he's currently reading called Divine Discontent, uh, if anybody's interested in that. And he reminds us that Du Bois lived 10 years in Baltimore. So, you know, we have to include Baltimore in that list. So we- Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He built a home for his first wife in Baltimore. Yes, yes. So Mary and, uh, He was still, he was in a commuter marriage at the time. So much of that, even though he's in the directory of, of citizens for Baltimore for some 10 years or more, much of that time he was also in New York. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morgan Brown. I, I, you know, it's, it's very difficult for me not to slip into familia name for you, but uh, forgive, right. <laughs> forgive me for that. Uh, uh, 
I, we enjoyed and thank you so much for your contribution to this series and for what you've done for us tonight. We are gonna open it up uh, for all of the participants who would want to uh, for a kind of after a party where we could ask a lot of questions and simply talk in common. So we are going to go in and look at that film on Clinton Church restoration. But if you stick around, if you want to stick around, we'll still be uh, around for uh, 10 to 20 minutes uh, if you want to join us uh, after the film. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing Rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Hello, I'm Ray Gunn, chairman of the Clinton Church Restoration Project. We are creating a nonprofit center for African American history and culture at the historic Clinton Amy Zion Church in Gray Barrington, which I attended for over 70 years. The Berkshires are rich with black history that is little known and sometimes misunderstood. For example, my ancestor, Agrippa Hull, served in the Revolutionary War and was the largest black landowner in Stockbridge. Once completed, our center will tell his story and those of W.G.B. Du Bois, Reverend Esther Dozier, and many more. Please help by donating to this historic project. We need your support. Thank you. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free.